And welcome to the second attempt at the Kansas City Woodworkers Guild November meeting. I forgot the microphone the first time. So, uh, I'm Craig Arnold. I'm the president of the Guild. And we've got kind of a, a small skeleton crew. And the crowd goes wild uh, working down here. Uh, we're going to hop through a few things. Um, the... Um, Facebook page is at KCWWG. We also have a Facebook group, the Kansas City Woodworkers Guild group. Uh, Instagram is Kansas City Woodworkers Guild. And also, um, if you would like to write a newsletter uh, for our or a newsletter article, uh, Ron would appreciate that. You can send those to newsletters at kcwg.org. Um, also want to remind uh, members that renewal starts tomorrow. Uh, you'll get a $5 discount if you renew uh, now through the uh, end of January. Uh, the renewal, you'll save $5 on your renewal if you re uh, renew by January 31st. Though uh, renewals do end on February 28th. After that date, you are considered a new member and will need to take your safety training over again. So if you're a member wanting to renew, uh, do it soon. Do it quickly. Um, also, for those of you who are uh, joining us for the first time, a, a guild membership makes a great holiday gift. <laughs> so i got to point that out. Um, let's see. What else was there? Oh, uh, we have Amazon Smile. For all of your holiday shopping, be sure to use the uh, am, Amazon smile.amazon.com. You may search for the Kansas City Woodworkers Guild, and uh, a percentage of your sale uh, will come back to the guild as a donation from Amazon. It doesn't raise your price at all, but it does help out the guild. And I think this year we've got over $500 back from Amazon, which is a nice, nice little uh, surprise every once in a while. Um, we don't have any show and tells this month, so we're going to move right into the uh, program. Unless there's anything else I missed. Nope. Okay. Uh, Patrick Hare is from Humboldt, Kansas, and he is an architectural cabinet maker. But what's unique about his shop is that everything is belt driven. There's no electricity running any of the machines. You do have lights, though, right? You don't have candles or kerosene lantern? Okay. <laughs> I'll explain that as I go. Okay. So, Patrick, come on up and welcome to the guild. Thank you. Sit down. <laughs> okay. Um, it's the first time I've done a basically a virtual presentation. Usually I'm surrounded, you know, in my shop by my machinery and my space. Um, so we're going to start, um, you know, with the dreaded PowerPoint, but actually it's very informative. It sets my credentials in a way. I have restored and operated two 19th century uh, line shaft driven um, woodworking shops. And primarily we'll end up focusing on my present shop but we'll go back to the history of the first. And um, so we're gonna start the PowerPoint here and go through it rather quickly. Uh, the small crowd is encouraged to ask questions, stop me uh, when they see something. And with this PowerPoint, uh, I start out by highlighting uh, the line shaft overhead flat belt line shaft system um, because that is the heart and soul of the power of the, uh, of the setups. Um, so um, they're probably the rarest thing that you would see in my shop being put to use. Uh, the overhead line shaft systems were uh, eliminated between the First and Second World War almost exclusively. Um, we can um, go back to my first mill. Now, I'm one of the few privileged individuals that in my hometown I was able to purchase um, and complete original 1880 planing mill, and it was called the Iola Planing Mill. Uh, I had not operated for four years. There was no belting left there. Uh, my younger brother, who was an important part of this, who did my finishing work, uh, when I bought it, we moved in my modern shop and slowly started restoring it. And every time that we got a uh, vintage machine restored and proven, 
I sold the modern counterpart. And so the end of that fable was one day I sold my final modern machine and I'm making a living. Uh, this is not a museum, this is a woodworking shop. And we are producing uh, with the 19th century machine, the line shaft system. Um, that came to an end with basically the lack of uh, financing to go any further. That mill was sold to a major museum in Wichita, um, the machinery was, and um, so I started over again. All the machine machinery in my present shop, uh, because there are no more complete shops left, um, are from all over the United States. So um, here we'll start out with, here again, there's the definition and the meaning of the line shaft system. Um, it's one thing we found out very quickly is um, I'm, I was modern. Uh, there's no logic uh, to the flat belt system at all. And so we're learning from scratch. Uh, the machinery has no ball bearings. That's, they're all Babbitt bearings. We had to learn how to pour Babbitt bearings um, without the internet to teach us. And because we're going back to the 80s. So go ahead. Um, here's a, a quick graphic um, showing basically the line shaft system uses one power source to drive many machines. So in the 19th century is water power or steam power and moving into the 20th century is single cylinder engines and then most of the mills were converted to a single electric motor drive and a complete line shaft which is what I use now so that I can um, be productive with what I do. And um, so go ahead and move on. Um, one more click. One more click. So what we're going to be seeing here is a few shots from my original mill, the Isle of Plenty mill. And um, so we're going to go from there, and I'll point out some highlights. But you have to keep in mind, uh, this was an incredible personal opportunity uh, to step into a, a complete shop. And our thoughts were that uh, just like a Model T can be restored and driven from here to California, these machines should be able to be restored and create uh, the millwork, cabinet work, and furniture work from the 19th century. And we pretty well proved this. Um, so here you're seeing the basic layout with the main line shaft in this one um, photo. And let's see, there's another photo here. So this is a big mill. Um, a lot of the small town plenty mills in the 19th century specialized in windows and window sash because the window factories in Kansas City, uh, shipping glass and, and putty, fresh putty by rail didn't work. So one of the primary products this mill made was um, window sash. But nevertheless, they gave us all the basic machines to do what we needed to do. So we're going to jump probably from in the next one. Um, okay, another, how beautiful the machines are. And... Um, and basically, that was a big part of what drew me into this is the, uh, the, the era of uh, beautiful cast iron machine making. And also, you can see here, a lot of the machines had wooden tops uh, in America. Uh, we had all the virgin forest and the wooden tops for, out of cherry and walnut and birch were extremely common. And um, so this was also creating, for me, as an artist and a craftsman, a very aesthetic surrounding. Okay. Uh, here's another overview, and it doesn't take much explanation to see that um, that's what got me hooked for the rest of my life. Uh, quick shot, that's my uh, younger brother. He's 11 years younger, and um, you'll see a young picture of me maybe in all this, maybe not. Um, for the first run on the molding machine, so here we have now the power of doing architectural level uh, moldings. And um, so you can more or less see we we're learning by trial and error. Okay, this is the picture, and that's me and my brother. So that was a long time ago. And um, one of the first things we found out uh, with the 19th century machinery, because they didn't have ball bearings, they had the, uh, the Babbitt bearing sleeves, is how inherently slower they operated. And this is our 24-inch planer. This was the first machine we restored. And when I used the tach tachometer on the end of the shaft and my brother's timing, you know, the revolutions per minute, 
And he stopped me, and it was 3,250 RPMs for a planer. And I said, Mike, can't work. I said, you know, it's modern planers, 10,000, give or take. You know, but it did, um, as they always did. And it came down to the difference in the geometry and the cutter heads that made up for the lack of speed. And uh, so that planer is running at 3,250 RPMs. The molding machine has the same size of cutter head on it. A year later, we restored it, and it was running at 3,250 RPMs. So we're kind of learning how this works. And um, so, and you all see by the uh, Palisades that, um, you yeah, know, we were making something at the time. So go ahead and see what's on the next one. I have a quick question. Sure. Uh, is dust collection part of what happens there? It's, that's a big pile of chips. Yeah. Um, I'm going to kind of back up here and say that in this shop and in my present shop, and my present shop is set up exactly as this is. There are virtually no guards on anything. And so when you come to this shop, you're going to see um, engineering 101 totally exposed, every gear, every pulley, every belt. Also, this is why OSHA exists, is there's that evolution. And as an early 20th century, about 1908, when safety was really being demanded and applied to uh, woodworking mills, um, definitely. I've chosen this route for my personal reasons, obviously. Uh, very engaging. Um, I've had my share of accidents. Um, but nothing that wouldn't happen in a modern shop, actually. The open belt system I find to be very benign and enjoyable. So that's how it works. Okay. Now, real quickly, when you come down to visit, um, I moved to Humboldt after selling that mill and bought a derelict 1876 carriage and wagon factory. And that's where I started collecting machinery from all over the United States, restoring it. Also restored the line shaft driven blacksmith shop. So, so here's an interior shot of the blacksmith shop. Um, that's part of my world. This is now on the National Register of Historic Places. Still needs a ton of work. Uh, my son has his glass bone studio on one section of this. Um, so here again, I'm getting to branch out a little bit more. Okay. Uh, another shot of the blacksmithing side there. Go ahead and move. Um, I actually got good enough with, uh, I have a friend who's a master, a blacksmith. I've repaired parts on my machinery. Uh, basically, we use it for historic demonstrations and or individuals coming in and using it. And at one time, we had um, six blacksmiths come down from Lawrence from the uh, their blacksmithing guild to perform for a day while I was performing uptown in my shop. So it's, it's a big part of that 19th century line shaft driven mail system. Okay. On. Okay, now we're getting into the machinery um, that is in my present shop. Um, and we're going to go through a series of slides uh, of the machinery. And so if anybody wants to stop or ask questions, I'll point a few uh, things out here. Number one, these machines do not look like this when I find them. These are full restorations torn down um, to the last nut and bolt. In my scrapbook over there shows this. A uh, very rare bandsaw in the condition I found it, taken apart and documenting the pinstriping, the colors, and then going through the sandblasting process to get this. This is a J.A. Fay bandsaw. It has patent dates on the frame going back to 1863. This is one of my primary go-to uh, bandsaws every day. Uh, this is a 42-inch resaw bandsaw. Um, um, Somebody's chuckling in the audience here. Um, that, that runs a three and a half inch blade, a resaw, um, oh, you know, three and a half inch, three. yeah. <laughs> uh, right now I'm redoing the setup because I didn't have enough horse, I don't have enough horsepower on that particular line shaft to make up for all the friction that is in a machine like this. Um, but it is fully restored with the new blade ready to operate. And you can see here again how inviting these machines can be. So go ahead. What length blade does that have? I on it? don't have to remember. It would be approaching 26 to 30 feet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Three and a half inches wide. <laughs> and there is just a front view of that same machine. Um, 
And here again, I could go into the stories of, uh, and, and there are stories of the road trips all over America to find these machines. Um, so we'll go to the next one here. <clears throat> Another shot. And stop taking pictures. Now, the pinstriping on this is not original to the era. This is one of the first machines I found when I was setting up in my new shop. I didn't find a table saw, I didn't find a band saw, I didn't find a joiner first, I found this. <laughs> and so I met a pinstriper and he came in uh, with a beer in one hand and he said he did it for $350 and if he didn't like it, he'd wipe it off and I said go. So it's a fun piece, uh, but very rare because these were production machines and this was, did not come out of a production shop. So uh, This is my single antenna coping machine. I had an identical one in my first mill. This is Holland Brown from St. Louis, and it's patented 1880. And I just got done doing mortise and timber panel frames for exterior wainscoting in one of the historic buildings in Humboldt on that. Okay, uh, that's a side view of that. And here again, going back to the, the world of cast iron, and I want to point it out right now, of every one of these machines, Every part of these machines, except for the iron shaft, was a wooden pattern. They were the master woodworkers of the era. And when you see what they were doing, it's beyond belief. Those big bandsaw frames that were just shown, those are hollow. And it's amazing. Okay, go on. Um, here's a, a partial picture of one of my post lays. Those yellow pine timbers are 20 foot long. I can turn 17 feet between centers on that. <laughs> so I'm going to invite the challenge. Here's the here's the end view showing the size that they laid. Uh, <laughs> of, um, and I have uh, three large post lays in my present shop right now. Um, this came from Fall River, Massachusetts. Uh, <clears throat> from that standpoint. So okay, uh, here's a shot of my uh, present 24-inch planer. It's an SA Woods. And uh, it came from the Fall River Mill as well. And um, it's an everyday user. Let's see what, and that's an end view uh, of the machine or side view, I guess you might say. Um, here again, a lot of the, uh, this is the second generation of 19th century water machines. So they're not quite as ornate as the first. It was the high Victorian that really got carried away. But the grace that comes natural with cast iron work and a little bit of pizzazz to go with them that brings it in. Uh, in the foreground is, um, here again, one of the cabinet pieces I'm working on as a prototype for one of my clients. Um, I want to point out again is I, uh, these machines are in full operation and this is what I make my living off of every day. Okay. Uh, there's the joiner. And I'll say this, uh, assuming your audience would understand, but this is the one machine that I'll sit in a chair at the end of the day with a beer and just stare at it, at the grace and the beauty that which is part of the natural design. And um, I did uh, demonstrate that to your members that came down to visit. And that's a match pair, the, the planer and joiner. So go ahead. Uh, the rarest machine, probably one of the rarest in the country. Uh, this is a um, copy or duplicating lathe that copies a regular in elliptical patterns. It's patented 1885. It's an Ober. Uh, Ober lathe, uh, their nicknames are axe handle or spoke lathes or flop lathes. And um, these were high production machines that could rough out uh, wagon wheel spokes one a minute. They're so rare. As if they were in production like this, uh, they were worn out in their first 10 years, maybe rebuilt and then discarded. This came from a shop similar to mine as a one man shop who just did custom work. And in the shop, I have over 50 of the original patterns. And, um, and I had it set up to demo to your members that came down uh, that I have the, an axe handle pattern in there. Um, so yeah, this is one of the very rarest, one of the crustiest machines I restored. But that set of cluster gears there are original and they look almost new. So, and there's a close up of the pattern and the piece being cut on the machine. Now, do you run that machine now at one a minute? No. <laughs> that is one of my rare machines. I will consider that a museum piece. We use them for demos and learning, and we will eventually produce a you know, product off of it. Uh, but it is so rare. 
and the knives on the 10 inch uh, cutter head um, are worn, still very usable, but would cost me a small fortune to replace. Um, and this is one of the machines that you wake up in the middle of the night wishing you had the manual that came with it. <laughs> okay, so we go. And these are just a, a few of the uh, uh, handle patterns. And it's just a wonderful story about how this all came about that I can't get into now. If you come to my shop, you'll hear these stories in length. One of those looks like a baseball bat. Well, there's part of the story. Is this came out of Alton, Missouri, and um, eventually we found over 50 patterns, and we found four baseball bat patterns. Well, that cutter head on that machine is designed to hog out as much wood in one pass as possible. In other words, that axe handle will be roughed out in one pass or that wagon wheel spoke. Okay, so I want one or two of baseball bats around, so why would, do we need this type of lathe? Well, a baseball bat blank starts out at two three quarters. You go down to one inch on the handle. It's a lot of wood to remove. He used his copy lathe here to wipe out all that waste wood down to one eighth of an inch. Then you take it to a regular uh, lathe and with calipers, you finish it up by hand. And I'm also doing that as demonstrations. Um, and the three bat sizes, four bat size was the 29 inch Little League bat, the 32, 33, and 34 that still matches today's proportions. So you can imagine how big baseball was in St. Louis in the 1890s. So uh, here's kind of an overall view of the shop. These photos here were taken in probably about 2007. Um, so the shop had been operating in this new location um, probably about two years. Okay. But you can see how predominant the belting is in this system, how expensive it is, also how much floor space was robbed by the system, and obviously the line shaft overhead. Um, this is the infamous uh, Liver Groover. Um, actually, it's patented in 1878, and this is an American, and we were talking about this, one of the individuals, so actually it have been produced in the 1890s. Uh, in one of my um, um, uh, catalogs over there, I have pictures of my students who came back with me from Colorado Mountain College in Leadville, Colorado, and did a run of shutters that the historic house they were going on said they could find nobody else in the country to make them. And uh, so here again, to see the technology in one of those machines is almost beyond belief. There's just the detail of the uh, main working parts of the Louvre Groover. Okay, here's um, Scheimer Shaper. Um, the one machine that they could not make up with the size of the cutter heads and the rim speed uh, for their slow speed, it was a shaper because you weren't going to be swinging large diameter cutters. So the biggest problem, and you, in, the, in the first pictures of my first mill, the big wooden top machine with the two spindles was a double spindle shaper. And one was used to run left, one was right hand. So when you're doing radius work and you're going into the grain, you go over here and finish it off the same machine. Scheimer was internationally renowned for making cutter heads for every kind of woodworking machines. This is the only machine they made because they made cutters that cut in both directions. And the cone pulley drive, you can reverse direction at full speed and start cutting the other way. And that also makes it very versatile. So if you flip a cutter head underneath your board for safety, you can feed it from the other direction. And I just did that on a, on a project two days ago. Uh, also, you can see the gracefulness in this type of machine. And I have a pair of these. And uh, they're very rare from, for several reasons. But the cone pulley drive, the two cone pulleys you see on each side, that's stacked compressed paper. So if that was ever exposed to the leaking roof or set outside, then those would have been ruined. And even these, I, you know, I will true up with lathe tools to, you know, bring them back to life again. Okay. Here's a, a good view. This is the, the small molding machine that's in operation in my shop now. It's a five inch molder, three heads, two cuts from the side and from the top. I have bigger molding machines, a couple of them offline right now. But that's what uh, really elevated me in my world was to be able to use the 19th century molding knives, the original profiles, and then finding companies who would duplicate the rare knives. And we might have a picture of these coming up in one of these. Um, so that 
I started trying to uh, make money reproducing uh, Victorian millwork, and it was not my world. I'm a cabinet maker, and furniture maker, and so I downsized to this one right here. Okay. Uh, here again, another oval, a good view of the shop, and those that came down recently, it's even tighter and more interesting than it is now. Um, but that shows the molding machine and the lever groover in position. Okay. Uh, here on the wall um, are a set of um, small set of my primary molding knives, original knives, and the moldings that uh, they make. I have probably five to six hundred of the original molding knives. Uh, this just happens to be what's on the wall at the moment. Okay, this is a big drill press. Was actually a pretty small drill press, um, but when you keep in mind. Um, the cast iron framing indoor, and you're seeing here timber framing in machinery. And this is an 8x8 eight eight timber uh, that ha is housing this um, drill press. And, um, and actually, the drill press is not much bigger than a, what, a Rockwell 14 inch or whatever size we start out with when we were kids. Um, but here again, that is my day to day go to, and also a very handsome machine. Um, now this is my modern machine. Uh, this is the famous Universal uh, Crescent Universal Woodworker. It's all five machines in one. Four of the five machines can be operated simultaneously with four men without getting in the way of each other. Um, this was a must-have because this is 100% complete, original paint, original decal. This came from Missoula, Montana. And um, I use it, go to as a backup. It's my third bandsaw. Uh, my big uh, JFA bandsaw, I always carry an aggressive quarter-inch blade. This one has the half-inch blade. And in the other room, which I don't have probably pictures of it, is a little 20 or a 26-inch crescent bandsaw, which is actually my resaw, because it has a, a, a dedicated rip fence on it, which is so cool for a bandsaw. Um, here's another shot. Of, you're looking at a joiner, 12-inch joiner and uh, what we call a 14-inch table saw. Okay. Um, so moving on, uh, this is shot down one of the line shafts. There's three working line shafts in this shop. My only historic concession is I do start and stop the line shafts with the old three-phase electric motors. Uh, it wouldn't be practical for me to start up a steam engine uh, or find the water power. Um, my f most original mills and my first mill uh, was switch from steam to the all three phase or the three phase motor in 1913. I have one GE motor with a 1900 patent date on it that's in use. So we're continuing that on. Um, so there's a, there's my shop, this present shop is in two distinct rooms with a large archway between um, and three line shafts. So here again another view from another point in the shop. Okay. The wooden pulleys. Here again, the aesthetics of a shop like this is, is amazing. And every one of these, these are original pulleys, but they have to be trued up with lathe tools. And I don't have pictures in my uh, um, scrapbooks over there. Uh, when I started over with this mill, you find all your wooden pulleys are out around, out of true, is I turned the line shaft upside down on saw horses, 22 foot long, turned it into a lathe, got a tool rest, and took care of them. And I've been known to actually screw a tool rest to the ceiling, climb up a ladder with a <laughs> with a uh, lathe tool in 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 um, dire need. So, <laughs> okay, here's my primary primary table saw. And uh, what's nice about this one? Well, several things are nice. Oh, and I'll point out real quick. I do have one major restriction: is I do not have a Tilton Arbor table saw. The, ba the uh, Babbitt-Berrien journal box is overall, it was just too heavy to manipulate. And so I've been told they exist, one may exist, I haven't found it yet. So that is very limiting. And either you tilt the whole top, for angle work, or you tilt your fence. And the bigger you get with your stock, the more counterproductive it, it is. Um, this one is on a wooden frame, cast iron top. Uh, in your original catalogs, uh, table saws were called saw tables because basically they were just attaching a saw to a table to them. Um, but this is one I use. As a matter of fact, 
I actually delaminated the belt in the background this year, and it was a new belt 22 years ago. And I said, I've been using this saw for that long. <laughs> and um, so anyway, we can go on from there. Oh, there it is. My counter shaft, or my line shaft, flipped over as a lathe. This is back in my original mill building. I'd sold the machinery out of it. I leased back a part of the, of the shop to start restoring machines. I sold it to a contractor. So that was a very important part of the process. And now you're starting to see, too, how personal this gets between the artisan, the craftsman, and the machinery. So, um, and I've been kind of talking about the challenges of the line shaft system and restorations. We can kind of jump through the next part of it. Um, because here again, it's like all machines, uh, every uh, wooden pulley has an oversized uh, shaft opening. You have a split shim, you know, there. Back then, they, they mass produced perfect split shims, and I have to make my own, that type of thing. And um, learning the, the, and here again, how much we learned from the first mill is um, the dynamics in the flat belt system are so contrary until you hit the perfect point and direction of drive for shifting ease, um, the distance for a quarter twist belt to track, can't be too short or too long. And so all that came into our learning curve from the beginning. And let's see. Oh, real quickly, I, I was hired by a Colorado Man College in, in Levo, Colorado for three years to be a part of the preservation program. And one of the reasons they brought me out there because the historic Hayden Ranch 10 miles south of Leadville is a line shaft driven system in the barn, driven off a, a water ditch from the headwaters of the Arkansas River. And um, it's being driven by a turbine that is down that shaft that had been shifted in. We got a grant to archeologically lift that up and, and, and begin preserving the barn and that system right there. And their first machine they hooked up was a sawmill then they put in a stationary hay baler, you know, and every, once you have a line shaft going, you got, you can just add and subtract all you want. So uh, here again, here's the uh, pin stock to that uh, turbine. And okay, so here, hopefully we can kick this on. This is a little video we inserted. And um, my partner, Susan, who was the educator librarian, um, Actually, she's the one doing the shifting for this particular uh, demonstration. And like I said, this is one of the smaller line shafts in the shop. And there is a certain decibel to the sound the whole system makes. Um, there's always a background cadence because every bell has a clip, and as the clip goes around, it's got another beat to it. And as anybody making a living in a woodworking shop, personally, if you can in ring so you don't have to change the blades, I do use two table saws, one with the data blade, one without, like I said, three, uh, whatever. And also maybe in some of the upcoming videos, um, and you can see that she's shifting from a loose pulley to a tight pulley. Some machines have the built-in shifters, others we use a fork stick because manufacturer didn't know where the power source was going to come from. Here again, that brings in the engaging part of it. Now you talked about the, like having a data stack. How many of your blades for different uh, tools has to be custom made, and how many can you go to, you know, okay. uh, the store and buy okay, well, off okay. the shelf? A, ta a table saw is a table saw, and always has been. So I do have carbide tip blade uh, that go on these as original, original. Band saw is a band saw, same thing there. Uh, once you jump from that, uh, the cutter heads on the planers, molders, um, um, the helical heads that are on the single antenna now. We had the helical heads going back to the 19th century. Um, so yeah, there's that crossover. And my original data blade that I've got, I won't even use it. And that's part of the demo when you get there. And uh, so here again, this is just one room of the shop. And this has the two smaller horsepower line shafts that um, operate uh, everything in this room. 
And I think coming up right here is one of our favorite machines. Um, you have oscillate spindle sanders. Okay, your oscillating spindle sander probably oscillates one inch. Mine oscillates seven inches. <laughs> and it's double spindle. <laughs> That's why Susan is doing the shifting and I'm taking the photos because I need the highlight. But you can see the dry belts here, which of course was how much floor space this and the counter shaft for the uh, table saw, you know, takes up in a shop. With okay. all the cast iron materials and, and space that you have to have to pace, place everything, what kind of load do you have on that floor? I'm curious how thick the floor is or how thick the uh, That is over are. full basement. Uh, the rooms are divided by a, a, a support stone wall, solid between the two. Um, I had to go in and put dedicated supports underneath everything. A lot of mills, uh, didn't matter what part of the country, were multi-story with mills. And so they had that same problem, what, where the, what they could load, where they could load, and what they would support. Um, the average weight of machines in my shop, average would be 1,800 pounds, uh, much more or much less, obviously, from that point. Um, so that is, and the, the building that I'm in now is a, is a uh, adaptive use for the building, and it was built in 1866. <laughs> but it's, it's a beautiful building, it's on the square of Humboldt, and that's when I really had decided um, to really make it into a personal furniture cabinet making shop. And you'll notice from the first mill where you could run 14 foot lumber on a car between machines, and in my shop, I can just barely get myself between machines. I know the that. spindle sander, was that they teeter tottering, one spindle up while the other one's down? Uh, they're on opposing cams, oh, okay. cam driven. It shows it better on this video. Uh, this one's yeah, Mike Jones. Right, right, right here, I think you're going to see it right And look at the uh, quarter twist bell that it was going from a vertical pulley to a horizontal pulley that is also moving up and down. And if, if you try to shorten those belts, it won't work. And if you try to make them too long, which you wouldn't want to, but they're not going to be there. Um, that's a good question. Go back to the early 19th century, all belts were leather. Uh, America had the huge cotton industry. And by uh, I have a catalog uh, from the Chicago Supplier that has the price list of leather belting and what they called cotton India rubber. As soon as they did a pregnant cotton with rubber, then that was the competitive new belt. Uh, the pictures of the cattle slaughter and the huge piles of hides, Kansas, uh, that was feeding the Industrial Revolution and for belting. And in the 1880, there's only a penny a piece in, in widths and lengths, so that competition was coming in. So it took a while, and that's a long story. The yellow pages for Kansas City is what I used back then to find, you know, a belting company, good a belting company, a belting company. And I can't remember the name, is right across the river. Uh, got the right salesman, he was my age, just in um, St. Louis. And they found the, the, the black two ply uh, India rubber and cotton belting. So this is the original period. Okay, here's my sanding technology. I have to have it. That's my strong stroke sander. Um, here again, engaging with the machine, I can sand anything to the size of that table. The table scissors down 12 inches, and that's a 33 foot, 6 inch wide sanding belt. And it's flex it's so far between the centers is I have sanding pads, convex and concave, that I can sand those shapes. Um, it's also why I have arthritis in the shoulder pretty good now. 25 years or more of resistance. Um, and here, yeah, and it's, it's akin to using a modern belt sander that you can do more harm than good until you use it. And that one, here again, you know, for the audience, is you have to pat your head and rub your tummy, and you've got to get that one going just right. And when you're doing frame panels, you don't want to fall into the opening and stuff like that. So there is a lot of that, um, yeah, that personal part of that. I think I got another video if you can find it. Anthony, he has a 17-foot lake. You, you, microphone. Yeah. <laughs> One more video coming up. I want you to come down and use it. 
What's, uh, what's the swing on it? Uh, right now, it's probably about 12 to 14. It's got one of the worst hen tail stalks in my collection, which will be being changed on. I have four large post lathes, but that one just happens to be on 20 foot timbers, which puts me about 17 foot in between. Um, not that I've done that yet, but we have the history of uh, Walter Johnson and George Sweat being born and raised in Humboldt, and Walter Johnson was top three best baseball player pitchers in the country. And I want to, with some help, do a baseball bat to scale, 17 foot long. For, for Humboldt, I'm sure he could. I'm an okay turner. And that's on my bucket list is to really get trained in turning properly. I do design turnings into a lot of my work, you know, whatever. Um, it's probably one of my meekest, weakest uh, talent points in my life. Anthony's got a class coming up. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony well, has I'm a gonna, class. We'll change information um, for sure. Uh, one, one of the books or, or the photo albums there is my son doing wooden pieces for his, his art, glass artwork for a senior exhibition. And I include that to show the user-friendly atmosphere. Now, when I have students come down, and my students from Colorado came down to do real-life projects, is we do put up guards for safety. And uh, unless I don't like the kid. Uh, um, you know, but I found when we, one of the, the first time we did a prototype of two shutters to see if we could bid on 24 shutters. And these are huge shutters, half one inch lat, half fixed lat. And in three days, we did the two shutters, you know. And so that's part of the, uh, that photo uh, essay there. And um, also was the first time I could walk out of my shop, across the street, turn around, and look through those big double doors, two pairs of double doors, and see my shop being worked. And they were loving it, you know. So, so there's, there is a, an attractiveness, uh, you know, to the whole thing. It's not just me. So... Okay, anything next? Okay, the... Um, Another video? Um, I to get a hold of. Now, I have hosted the Topeka Woodworking Guild when I was still in the carriage and wagon shop, and they did a wonderful episode, which we have here, whether we can bring it up or not, yeah, I can get that is... Um, by this time of my life, I'd become fairly well known, particularly in the area for what I do. And uh, you're all familiar with Sunflower Journeys. Okay, and um, I'm doing one of the biggest, most difficult jobs. And it was like um, Friday morning, and I get a call from Bill Schaefer. He said, we're in southeast Kansas filming, and someone said, we need to come and look at, check your shop out. How about tomorrow? And I go, great. Right in the middle of everything I'm doing. And so I didn't shave, I didn't change, put on clean clothes. I just went down that same morning to go to work. And it looked like it was about the way it was going to go because Bill Schaefer showed up alone. No photography crew, no nothing. He said, but don't worry, I know how to do this. And so I had a, a drafting stool, and he said, put that in the middle of the room. He's putting the mic on me, setting up the lights, and I'm in the blacksmith side of the shop. And before I know it, he's interviewing me. He just segued into interviewing me. And so we spent about two and a half hours together, and I had a wired mic. I'm dragging it all over my belts and everything else like that. And uh, we had a great time. Now, what was awesome about this is he's interviewing me. We're talking. Of course, I'm telling. He edited that down to about 14 minutes, and he's out of it, and I'm presenting it as if I wrote it. That's what makes it so good. Also, it shows that evolution in my life. You know, from my first mill, which I had sold, uh, going to a derelict building, starting over and also tapping into the, the, the blacksmith shop and um, just continuing to move on from that point, so. You mentioned that you uh, have picked these machines up all over the country. How do you find them? And what kind of condition are they in when you do find them? Um, they don't look like what you saw on, <laughs> on these shots here. Um, that was troublesome because, um, and, and my first mail went to Old Cowtown Museum and after 26 years, it's still in storage. I'll stop there. Uh, I found a couple of machines myself. My sister and her family lived in Austin, Texas. There is a, a um,
Plenty Mill in Galveston, Island City Plenty Mill that was featured in Fine Woodworking in the early 80s. I went down to visit and I got a hold of the older owner and went down to check it out. And um, he didn't have it operational, uh, still an amazing setup. And I said, I'm thinking about doing this again. Do you know where I can find the machines? And he says, Weimar, Texas, it's a little town about the size of Humboldt, 1,500 people. And he said, uh, that guy has them, but he has them sitting out front. So I go back, head on back to Austin. I stop there, meet Gary Chernock. And he had started buying 19th century wood machines, thinking he wanted to do this, and he decided he didn't. His vintage of machines are from 1930, 40, and 50, and some 60. The heyday of the perfect woodworking machines. And um, so, to shorten the story, we started becoming traveling partners. And so when we went to a mill, went, you know, an auction, we were competing. He had the pickup in the fifth wheel trailer. There's pictures in there of two loads, one coming from Fall River, Massachusetts, and one, one coming back from St. Louis. And we did that for 20 years. And it, one lead, you know, a friend of his who advertised architectural uh, reproduction work got a, a uh, flyer for the mill that was going to be torn down in Fall River. And a real quick story is Gary called up. He's a bachelor. He does, he's probably the top 10 best machine woodworkers in the country. He does nothing but woodworking 12 hours a day, seven days a week, and when he takes, does take a vacation it's to go someplace and get a machine. Okay, and he's an encyclopedic and photo uh, memory. So anyway, he called up one day and said, and he told me, he said, I'm, I'm flying out to check out that mail. And I said, you need to come with me. And I said, Gary, no. Too poor and too busy, not doing it. So he flies out. And two days later, he calls and he says, uh, "Got good news and bad news for you." I said, "Give me the good news." He says, five machines here, and you got to have." And I said, "Gary, I told you I'm not coming." And I said, "That's the bad news, and there's five machines I'm supposed to have to have." And he said, "I got this figured out." He's back home in that South Central Texas. I look at my trailer. I'm going to drive back out. Best route. Then you're going to fly out on Friday, and we're going to spend two or three days unloading, or you know, and then loading up. And then you're going to fly back, so you don't complain about taking too much time. And then I'll drive back through Kansas and drop him off. <laughs> so he's my enabler, totally enabler. But he, you know, seriously, I walk in, it's like, but he is a master window reproductionist, door reproductionist, shutter reproductionist, um, period. And so, um, and a lot of our finds were in St. Louis. That's another long story, that area there. And uh, some of the precious ones, the big resaw bandsaw, was down. Came from Higginsville, Missouri originally. And that frame was down to rust and outside with no parts on it. And finally, when I found out that the had put all the original parts in a building that still had the original paint and oil on it, um, I made a deal. And so, yeah, it's a matter of chance. And I've been pretty lucky, I think. Um, the axe handle lathe, uh, the owner would not sell that to me until he died. Well, I mean, his family sold it to me after he died. Um, he was a treasure trove and a character. His last name was Camp. He said, just call me Cooley. And um, we took at least four fifth wheel trailers out of his world and collection. So. <laughs> this must be another set of pictures on one of the discs. These are... Uh, oh, no, those are these are the ones recent. Are, are as soon as I saw them. that. Yeah. And, um, yeah. In the background in that Gothic cabinet is some of my son's glass work. Give him a little... These are, these are original black and white from the original catalogs, which I've hand watercolored. I have I've had every one of these machines. Um, also, research. Uh, there's one fellow in America, Dana Batery, and you can find out about him more on vintagemachinery.org. He has spent, what, 30 plus years collecting dirty paper, which is the original catalogs and manuals and books. He publishes an index and he will copy him, entire book or one page at a time. In my collection now, the machinery I'm using, I probably have 70% of them fully documented through this kind of research. And when I say that the axe handle lathe can produce so much 
is I've got the catalog documented. And one thing too about this era and, and talk about the safety and the condition and how I idealized this is, is when in a catalog they were given the production status of this machine, how much it could do. It always starts out with a man and a boy in a 12 hour day compartment. And that says a tremendous amount. That's 12 hours a day, six days a week. The man is responsible for the product in the machine. The boy is there to feed and take and clean. And uh, that's the way it was. Back to dust collection, in your bigger mills, um, they did have dedicated dust collections on the machinery. All small bills, mills, to adapt these machines to dust collection was counterproductive. And um, so there was the broom and um, whatever. And at times in my carriage wine shop, I had the giant wood stoves. And I never, th you know, threw out a shaving kind of shovel to fit into the stove and there we would keep going from there. And so obviously it's been a romantic choice in life, but it's also been very productive and very competitive in the world that I work in. I'm doing the fourth um, kitchen for the same couple in 26 years. From um, originally it was a Gothic Victorian house, then it was a craftsman style house. And it was their dream house, and it was um, uh, French Provincial, and now it is their retirement home, and it's very contemporary, <laughs> easy to clean, riffs on white oak, beautiful, you know. So that history is, is fun in, in my life too, and the in the input. Um, well, one thing nice too is I've done obviously a lot of kitchens and historic houses, and. Um, I can copy the crown moldings in the rest of the house. I can do a lot of this. And one of my favorite stories in the little town of Humboldt is when I finally got my second mill set up and going there, uh, a local fellow inherited his millions and he turned a, um, a large uh, six room, two story hotel into a bed and breakfast in a five star restaurant. And of course I did a lot of work there for them. And it was a huge building so they were short, 500 plus feet of baseboard, 500 uh, feet of casing. And in that little town, not only did I not have a 19th century mill, I had a 19th century molding machine, and I had the two original molding knives matched both of them. Oh my goodness. Which would cost him, because those, those uh, big knives with the square heads on those, a pair of knives for a four inch casing probably now is 400 to $500. Uh, the two uh, knives on the square uh, planer, uh, here again, probably up to six or $700 now. And uh, so there's a little bit that goes with that. But here again, I worked the, and I work alone. The three years my brother worked with me and extremely compatible. He's the one, my older brother is two years older. My younger brother, Mike, is 11 years um, younger. Um, both of them are way more mechanically inclined than I am. Um, so when, like I said, when I couldn't keep my brother busy with finishing work, I say, start tearing down another machine and see what we have. And, you know, it, what, a, what a team. You know, we discovered that the square head on the joiner had T-slots on two sides for putting molding knives in the jointer. Which explained why the leading edge was all chipped up because when you adjust it, your knives are sticking out. And I did use it. That's one that we boxed in for ultimate safety on. Um, and the machine privileged to operate in the first mill, and there's pictures in there, is a nine foot tall, cam-driven reciprocating mortise and machine working right in front of your face, chopping like this, you know. Uh, we were talking about the, the, the pendulum or the swing saws was the primary cutoff saw of the day. And in my original mail, there was that lone swing saw hanging from the ceiling, no table left underneath it, just the wickedest looking thing on the planet. Um, when we got it restored, their counterbalanced 24 inch cross cut capacity, you could take your little finger and swing it out. It wouldn't run through because it it's too heavy and swing back out. And I did put on a probably a 1950 DeWalt blade guard on it between me and that blade <laughs> when we used it. You know, there are certain things I want to go. But here again, swing saws and lumber yards, they were, they were big in lumber yards too, is uh, then came the direct electric motor driven machines in the early 20th and Holland Brown was a big leader in that out of St. Louis. And I got a hold of a swing saw that had a five horsepower motor this tall, 
sitting on top of its own frame. And somebody who's, uh, Matt was telling me, look for the Darth, Darth Vader building. Well, we had the Darth Vader <laughs> cut off. So, you know, that's gone by the wayside since that time. Um, so yeah, and coming down, there's, like I said, there's ways of looking at a shop like this, like engineering be exposed. And when I have uh, junior high school students to her, I will ask the question, how many of you like ge uh, geometry and algebra? And you get the universal grown, a couple hands go up. And I said, I'm sure glad I did. And because from my first mill, we found out that line shift is only lumbering at 250 to 275 RPM. So how are you going to kick that up to 3250 at that machine up there? Well, in between, all the machines are on the machine is the counter shaft that is in tie pulley. Okay, that same counter shaft is where you're jumping up from 250 RPMs to 750 or 800 RPMs. Then from that counter shaft, you're going that quantum leap, you know, at, at that level. And um, so, yeah, it's... It, Oh, am I going in and out? Yeah, you're going in and out. Okay. Um, well, I thought you were going to reach up on this one. So do we have anything else to show, Chris? Yeah, uh, hey, uh, where do people find her? You know, where, where just questions, yeah. So where do people find you? If uh, uh, Are you on Facebook, on any of the social medias? They can I'm see not much. I, I'm a well-kept secret from a standpoint. I've been in National Magazine several times, um, you know, and featured here and there. I don't advertise because I work alone and I have enough work to keep going. Um, we are doing a lot more advertising. Uh, I've partnered with um, our local, I'll just use the word philanthropist, who is going to make sure that whatever happens to me that stays there intact, uh, that the 1866 building will get finally restored. Uh, things like that are going on, the renaissance in the town itself. Um, I was just interviewed for Southeast Kansas Living Magazine last week. Uh, the second time I've been in that magazine. Um, so right now, I, yeah, I've sent people to my Facebook site. It's Patrick Hare. And make my uh, profile picture, whatever, both shop pictures. And, you, and if you friend me, you can go through my photos and stuff like that. My old computer died from my years of being in Colorado Mountain College. I just took to a computer shop to retrieve all the photos and a flash drive for me for all that evolution. Uh, I could bore you to death, but I'm proud of uh, what I do and the work, and, and I have not printed a whole lot of stuff out yet because they're accessible, you know, on the cloud and whatever. And every one of the jobs I do is different, so having a scrapbook of what I've done only proves that I can do that. So I list my client, and then we'll go to, to a job site or something to see what's being done. One of my most recent jobs was a second job for clients. The first job was uh, by going with Springs, Colorado. 19 years ago, three years ago, she called and, and she said, are you still doing what you used to do? I said, yep, how about you? She's an Aspen designing lady. And she says, well, I just married a fellow. And we're getting ready to do it again. And that's only down the road 50 miles. So she and I are a team. I turned her on to my sources. There's a sawmill uh, 10 miles outside of Humboldt. He had uh, bundles that he cut 20 years ago and labeled smartly of a spalted wormy pecan to die for. And that's what we did, everything in our house out of. And she picked, they bought enough of that, like three or 4,000 board feet that he had uh, for all of her flooring to be 10 inch plank flooring out of spalted pecan. And I, get, and I get to do the whole damn, excuse me, kitchen out of spalted pecan. Or here again, uh, years ago, a uh, retired engineer who grew up in a small town not too far from us uh, was building his dream house and he said, Mm, what should I do? What should I build my cabinets on? I said, I kind of like oak. Of course, by this time in my life, just red oak was nothing. I said, I think you ought to do it out of quarter sawn white oak. He said, really? I said, well, I'll bring you a sample. And um, so I designed the kitchen out of quarter sawn white oak, all with Gothic arches, and I got to use maybe, what, 2,500 board feet of quarter sawn white oak. <laughs> oh, in my kitchen for one of my houses, my wife and I, is... Um, in my horse trading and the guy that had the big resale, his stepdad, he had one of the old molders and blah, blah, blah. So did a lot of horse trading. And uh, he was making hardwood flooring, modern, in the 60s off this one machine. 
and he had gone over to Missouri to the um, the whiskey barrel making places, and he buy pallets full of the whiskey barrel shorts out of quarter sawn white oak. And so I designed my kitchen canvas in four small panels. And that picture of me and my brother, you know, I saw this, we're playing those little suckers down, kicking them out as fast as we can. And um, another job was, you know, here again, everybody asked what's the favorite, but this was um, architect designed and specified, was 100% um, heartwood cherry, 100% front back size and everything else you know and I think I spent $22,000 in materials on the kitchen and it was about three times that much to do the whole kitchen that's outside of between Baltimore and Lawrence and then I got to do original reproduction work in the house later on um, so yeah it's it's there's always something around the corner when you know I thought there wasn't and the biggest thing about my existence, and I have given interviews and, and, and whatever, is how did I creatively use my creativity to survive in small town America? Because the story of the first mill was, is um, like I said, we sold the modern machines, we're using the old machines, the only thing we hadn't done is drop the main line shaft to restore it, that's the only thing we hadn't done. But this is our heyday of design build from me and my brother, amazing. Well, we saw a, a slack time. I said, well, I'm going to go get a short-term loan with $2,500. We're going to drop it, and we're going to spend a month doing that. So I went to my banker. He says, man, we got to cut you off here because we just don't know what the value is, is what, with what you've got and what you're doing. Well, that's when the museum discovered me, and I sold those machines for over twice as what I owed the bank and then sold the building separate, and that's what I started over with. Uh, my insurance, I had grandfathered in with me from my modern to my old whether they knew it or not, it grandfathered in. <laughs> but now I sold everything away, and I had money in my pocket. I buy the derelict carriage wagon shop and start collecting machines, and there's a point where I have to go to the bank to borrow money for the roof or the windows, and now I have to have insurance because I dropped my insurance. Nobody would reinsure me. We got down to the point of Lloyd's in London. We actually did. You know, for a $25,000 policy, they'd only charge us $25,000. <laughs> but when I when I sold the mail, my, my brother he went back to school, smartly got his business degree, and went to work for State Farm Insurance. <laughs> and when we had family reunion, I told Mike, I said, "Hey, the proverbial brick, brick wall, I can't go on if I can't get insurance." And he said, "Well, I really like a, a older gentleman who's an underwriter, commercial underwriter. I'll see if he'll come down." He came down. In the middle of winter, with the wood stove this big and seven foot tall, backed up to it in the woodworking shop. Obviously, no dust collection, and whatever. And one of the biggest problems was uh, depreciation and appreciation of what I do. And he recognized that those machines were appreciating. Everybody else would depreciate them. And in about oh, 30, 40 minutes, he said, "I got everything I need. I'm going to go back to the agent. She'll call you tomorrow for your personal um, information, and she'll take you from there." So the next day. Betty called me, and we go through the personal information. And then she said, I really no need to come down and see that shop. And I kind of chuckled and said, people get a kick out of the old machines. So she said, no, I have to come down and see it because our underwriter gave you the best rating for a woodworking shop, period, that can be had. Because he saw how earnest and honest and amazing this all was. So I was saved again. <laughs> and just real quick, in the tight audiences, now 2007 comes. And um, going good, and I'm in my new building uptown, and it's early summer, and I switched banks. That's another long story. And they had sent their new uh, loan officer, young fella, down to my shop, and he's carrying my inventory list like it's contaminated. <laughs> he peeks in the door and says, Ken wants to know where on the internet we can get comps for your machines. <laughs> Compare. <laughs> Here we go again a decade later. And I says, you're looking at the only person that can tell you what these are worth, and you're not going to let that happen. Well, I went back down to talk to Ken. Uh, that bank was going through some trouble, and Ken and Tom were what I call mercenary bankers. They were giving up loans, and they were pulling loans. So I told him the story, and I said, we don't want this to happen. I promise you I don't lose money. I don't want to break even, blah, blah, blah. So I kept going. You know, that would have been late spring, early summer, 2007. Middle of summer, Colorado Mountain College discovers me. Uh, director flies down. I get hired. I only have an associate's degree in biology. I got hired on my lifetime experience, full salary benefits. And so in August, I go out and start a career out there, shut my shop down. 
Well, guess what was happening? The arborization was getting ready to hit strong by 2011. In those three years, 80% of most, 80% uh, of all small wooden shops went under permanent, permanently, and I would have gone under because I was in that same position. This is small business. I have no grants, no. Everything is just a small business loans and make it or not make it. And so I squeaked through that one, come back home three years later and open it back up, and here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that scrappiness and determination to make it happen. And here again, and also talking about the interest in a shop like this, it's not just a guy thing. And I noticed that very early on because a guy would bring his wife and kids in for his purpose. And they'd be sitting there aboard until I hit the line shafts and then the kinetic thing. And then I could say, okay, this is the type of lathe your table leg would have been turned on, blah, blah, blah. And then it's engaged. Now I'm on the square of Humboldt and there's a huge revival in the industry there. Um, B and W turn of a ball hitcher now employs 400 in that town. So I have children now going up and down, going to swimming pool, and they stop and they look at my door. They'll stop and look. I look 200 years old to them, and that's Willie Walker's chocolate factory times 10. And we engage, you know, and you know, as kind of like the town character, what are they seeing? And uh, it's fun. It's amazing, you know, to have that coming back into the world again. So that's your new apprentices there. Yeah, and a lot of people do ask me real quick, do you have an apprentice? Well, it would take two years full-time teaching to teach the basics of what I've done over the last 35 years. And you better know how to already run a modern table saw because we're not going to start there. That type of thing. Now, my son, who's, 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 who's a well-known glass blower, he can use the machines, but he's not interested in it. And like I said, I couldn't bring him into the shop to teach him at age 12. I would have, but his mom wouldn't let that happen. And um, so um, I am selling the carriage and wagon shop because I'm downsizing on contract to a, a fellow in his mid-30s who is going to be, I'm going to be his mentor. And here's how we're doing it. He wants to play down a slab of wall here, and this is how this starts, this starts, this side. Next time, try it. If you don't feel comfortable, I'll come down again and talk to you, and we'll go from there. And so that's how we're kind of doing that right now because I have to work full time. Also, this shop here, I live directly upstairs. <laughs> the dead of winter and ice storm, I don't have to go out the door for three days. Um, no, here again, it's the old world experience and that has been announced to, be, unbeknownst to me, my, my goal all my life apparently. And here again, um, going back to the machinery, you know, I talked about the pattern makers. These were all in-house. You had the engineer, you had the pattern makers, you had the foundry workers, and they're all masters of all their trades, and no one ruled because the pattern maker says, send that idea back because they ain't going to work, you know, or vice versa. And there was that mutual development and working together. Uh, when I first started collecting machines, they had broken or missing parts. Um, Lightning Industries had just opened. We're going back 25 years ago. If I could make the pattern, they would cast for $2 a pound. So off I go. And I'm learning a lot about pattern making. And in two years, they shut down. And there's not a uh, uh, cast iron shop in 500 miles now. Um, and it is such a lost art and such a lost beauty. And all I can say is you have to just see it <laughs> and hear it and smell it. That's another part of it is the Babbitt bearing system is, um, is all open oilers. That's another engaging thing. And even I, I mean, I make a living. I get as sloppy as anybody else. Well, I will, you know, I may have not used a mulling machine for six months. And I said, well, I'm just going to do 100 feet, start it up. It'll tell me. I'll smell it get hot. <laughs> I had a, uh, um, was um, commissioned to make uh, 50 fine dining room chairs for that bed and breakfast uh, restaurant in Humboldt. And I never wanted to do anything like that. That's production work. And my uh, rich nephew from Sugarland, Texas, volunteered to come up work with Uncle Pat. So I'm going to have to set something up for him to do. So all the back legs, he's going to sand out the curve, and I make a sanding disc out of a wooden pulley. And so I get him going. And usually I'll work 15 to 30 or 40 minutes on one machine or one thing before I turn things or move on is my method anyway. So he's in the, in the room and he's, got, he's going, he's working. And there's, a, you know, there's 80 or 100 legs to do it. 
So finally, after it's about an hour, and I hear him, he hits the disconnect, and he comes in the other room. I'm in the other room. He says, Uncle Pat, what, Uncle Pat, what do I do next? I walk over, and the hot bearing, the smell, the smoke, and I'm going, oh, God. So I'm going to fit the headstock. That's cool. Counter shaft's right above it. It's cool. No, it was one of the center line shaft hanger bearings smoking. Well, what had happened, those have an oil the sling ring. I had that line shaft in operation for a while in my other mill, and when I carried it, I knew, I remember, I spilled it and forgot to fill it back up, you know. And so, you know, here again, all that kind of stuff plays into it. So. Great. All right. Is this on? Good? Okay. Well, Patrick, thank you very much. Thank you. Have... Enjoyed. I'll take this off for a second. We have a, a gift that we give to all of our speakers. Oh. So that's the only way you can get one of these mugs, and we have the mug shop here. And everybody Thank knows you. my coffee drinking addiction, so this will be perfect. That'll be a awesome. good one for your collection. So. Awesome. So. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It. I enjoy doing this very much. And uh, and we'll see you. There we go. And we'll see you, uh, I guess, all next month. We do plan on having another uh, guest speaker for the December meeting. Uh, we won't have our traditional dinner as we're used to having. But we hope to someday eventually start having you all come back down here to the guild for meetings but it's not going to be for a while anyway see you next month uh happy thanksgiving uh be safe uh, wear your mask wash your hands don't touch your face so go through the whole thing so we'll see you bye-bye